we are talking about what can businesses do? Because the other thing we've been doing recently at the Economic Opportunities Program, we recently launched something called uh, Good Companies, Good Jobs. And we see that there are some companies that create sort of better than industry standard jobs in the in the uh, industries in which they work. Uh, they make different choices in their business model and they do this in ways that are also good for their business. So the question that we have is really what can businesses do to create more good jobs because we desperately need them. Um, and with that I will turn it over to uh, Judy Samuelson. It's a perfect segue for Judy who runs the Business and Society program. Hi, good morning. So we have two themes this morning. We're really focused on what we like to call, what are the choice points for business? So just kind of the establishing ground, this conversation could go in lots, and conver lots of different directions. We know how complex this question is. Everybody's here probably because we have some kind of a shared goal of creating uh, a, a healthy economy that embraces as many people as possible. So what we'd like to explore this morning is kind of two themes. One is, what is business actually thinking about in this domain? What are kind of the choices they have to make? What's this conversation? How is it alive in business, and how do we move forward? And the second piece of it is, wh where are the leverage points to actually drive change from within business? One of the stunning statistics from the last uh, decade is that if you cast back into about the 1970s for public companies now, about half of the profits went to shareholders in the form of dividends or return. The other half was for the company to invest in all of the things that companies need to invest in, including employees. Today, it's more like 85 or 90 percent of the profits of public companies are actually going to shareholders. That leaves much less for the company to invest in all kinds of things, including employees, but also research and development, plant and equipment, the other things that are essential to long-term success. So at the Business and Society program, we work on these questions of how do we align business with the long-term health of the commons? And this topic is an important one in that domain. So we'll also talk about, we have a panel that spans business and investment and also labor. And so what we're going to do is just kind of, we're going to take some quick soundings. We don't have a lot of time this morning. We only have about 35, 40 minutes. And so, and then we're going to open it up to the room and see where the conversation takes us. So if I could, the two women at the end um, do hail from, uh, have spent time in public companies. And I'm going to cold call Bobby. None of these people had any prep. Bobby didn't even know she was going to be up front. So we're going to be very generous with her this morning. But Bobby has spent the bulk of her career working in the public company domain. And she's worked in companies where these questions are very immediate in retail sector. So Bobby, I just would start out with you. If you could talk a little bit about kind of the jobs question. What, what's alive in the public company in which you've served? Yeah, what's sure. alive for this question? And you can talk both internationally as domestically as sure, you want. Sure, sure. So, um, one of the things, I'm not going to go into things that we do to help develop youth to bring into the company uh, because we employ a lot of young people, because I'm going to talk about that in a session at, in this building at 1020. Uh, but one of the things we've been talking about um, is hiring for the future because what, we're, uh, what we've typically done when we've hired people in business is that you look at someone's resume and you look back at their experiences and you have competency models and all of those things, which have served us well in the past. But the world is changing so quickly that what we need to do is we need to look at candidates differently. And while experience and skills do matter, what we now need to do is look for more qualities of adaptability. Um, are they um, flexible? Uh, do they have a great deal of curiosity? Um, the company that I just retired from, uh, Gap Inc., that uh, we used a potential model to understand what is the potential of a, a candidate, what are the potential of executives in the company, because the world is being rewritten, and what we can't do is we can't hire candidates solely by looking back at what they've done and what they know, because the future is going to be about not just what you know, 
but how equipped are you to be flexible and adaptable to the changing world and the patterns that are forming in front of us that we quite haven't figured out yet? And if your mind won't work that way, if you don't have a growth mindset or a mindset that is um, facile with change, uh, you're not gonna be a big contributor as the world continues to change and as business continues to demand innovation. Just to put a little context, now, I know you've left the gap, so you're not speaking for the gap this no. morning, but just remind us the scale of the gap. How many employees it had and where? 135,000. 135,000. Yeah, around the globe. Around the globe. Yes. And if you tried to estimate, um, were the contractors all also, did, were your contractors committed to the gap, or did you have, do you have any estimate of how many employees you touched through your supply chain? Uh, through the supply chain, it's probably about a million. Okay. A million, a million people okay. in the supply chain. Nadia, let's turn to you. So Nadia Rollinson is the Chief Human Resources Officer for Live Nation. Mm -hmm. Many people don't know, people here may, uh, I had 50, to be 50. told, 50-50, yeah. who know yeah. what Live Nation is. So right. describe the company first and your role there. Uh, good morning, and cheers to everyone who woke up and got here. Um, so Live Nation Entertainment's a Fortune 500 uh, media and entertainment company. Um, we are uh, $8 billion in top line revenue. Um, we've been around, or public, I should say, for the last 12 years. We spun out from uh, Clear Channel Entertainment uh, back then, before um, our current CEO took over. Um, and we have, during normal sort of cycle times, about 12,000 employees, full-time and part-time employees in 40 different countries. But during this time of year, which is our season, since we do the largest concerts and live events and festivals around the world, we balloon up to 40 to 50,000 people with contractors and sort of a temp, temp hires. So what piece of this, is it fair to ask this question, what piece also cold calling her, she get like 15 seconds of advance notice that I was gonna ask her this. No problem. What piece is alive for you and for your company in terms of all of this complexity of what constitutes a good job? What kinds of issues are even discussed inside the company in terms of any, anything that that might bring to mind? So it's interesting, uh, when we initially talked about this, my first question was, what, what is a good job? How are we defining that? Um, so I don't know how closely you all follow business or sort of uh, human capital trends, but um, Netflix just released their new freedom and accountability um, sort of description about their culture. They refreshed it. I, I'm assuming it's as a reaction to the things that are going on with Uber and from their cultural um, sort of investigations. Um, so their, their thrust would be, you know, we are a company that creates dream teams, right? So, you know, we hire A players always. It is a up or out sort of mentality. You know, we, um, you may be great, but you may not be great tomorrow for what the needs are. Um, so it's a very sort of, uh, you know, the best, may the best person win type of mentality. And I know this because I know a lot of the folks over there in the HR function. Um, for us, we're sort of the counterpoint to that. We're more of a family. Um, and so when we think about good jobs, it's creating jobs for people that they feel like they can sustain their lives over the course of their life phases. So Live Nation is comprised of four different divisions. Most of you may be familiar, familiar with Ticketmaster. Um, that's where sort of the bulk of our employees sit um, in a more sort of enterprise tech, linear, traditional um, sort of environment that exists there. The other end of the spectrum is our concerts business, which is very localized, lots of small pods of independent folks who may or may not have gotten formal education, um, who work in small groups and teams of people from when they were 18 to 20 years old and have grown up with the company. Um, and, and we have a couple of different other uh, sort of divisions in between a, a advertise, media and advertising unit and then an artist management group. Um, so when you think about that, when you think about the different, uh, the diverse employee types that we employ, it really isn't about one model of what success looks like or what the sort of, um, uh, sort of the skills and uh, capabilities that a particular employee will have. It's really about how can we make sure the business is robust enough that when people join, we have a very high retention rate. Um, our attrition's in the single digits. Um, when people join, they can stay and have a career that evolves with them as their life choices and their life experiences evolve. So is, does the change in minimum wage that we're starting to see mm -hmm. around the country, how much is that affecting you? Well, in certain states, it's you know, quite pertinent. With a lot of our employee base in California, that's huge for us, uh, New York, Boston, et cetera. Um, those are things that we're just starting to wrap our heads around. So from a financial impact, clearly 
that's something that we're modeling out right now. Um, but, but again, we don't have huge hiring goals, but we also don't have huge turnover. Right. Uh, so for the folks that are there, it's making sure we're taking care of those that are already there. And you would have workers who are at the minimum wage. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we also own um, House of Blues Entertainment, so a lot of clubs, theaters. If anyone's from the West Coast or L.A., a lot of those clubs and theaters right. in West Hollywood, et cetera, we think of that as... Um, sort of pipeline breeding grounds for new and up and coming talent. So you have a lot of folks who are dishwashers, uh, you know, security folks working at our venues or um, amphitheaters, et cetera. Um, so a lot of minimum right. wage. So huge issues. Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Great. David Rolf. David hails from SEIU in Seattle, worked on the fight for 15. So you might tell us a little bit about your work and then what constitutes a good job? Sure. Um, so I'm David Rolf. I'm the founder and president of SCIU 775, which is a 45,000 member union of uh, workers in the long term care sector of the healthcare industry based in Seattle. Um, I'm also an international vice president of SCIU and I'm sort of a serial co founder of worker facing not for profit organizations. Uh, where I hold the title of president or chair at seven not for profits, including health plans, pension funds, schools, and community not for profit They're organizations. All union. All, all about work. workers, uh, not all unions. Uh, and you know, some of the work that I've had the fortune to be involved in include the leading the largest union organizing campaign since the attack on Pearl Harbor back in the 90s when we organized 74,000 home care workers into SEIU in Los Angeles, and then more recently the first two successful campaigns for $15 wages in SeaTac and Seattle. You know, I, I think. Most, as Justice Potter Stewart once said of obscenity, you know, you know it when you see it uh, with respect to a good job. But I think there are probably six things that you could say most people would agree make jobs good. A wage that's, that allows for an adult and a child to live independent of government assistance in the market where they work, uh, as well as to save for emergencies. Uh, a workplace that respects and promotes physical and mental health uh, that's safe for people to go to work in. Three, non-discrimination and equity, so that everyone has the chance to do their best on the, on the job. Number four, scheduling and leave policies that allow people to plan for their life and to both have sufficient income, but also to have sufficient predictability to plan for all the non-work portions of their life. Uh, number five is a sufficient employer contribution to benefits that uh, allow people to take care of their health and their retirement planning. And finally, a vehicle for workers to have a voice on the job. <clears throat> um, I think those are essentially the six elements of what would be considered a good job by, by many people. And I'll just say, not to put too fine a point on it, but this is, these are not the sorts of jobs our economy has been producing in recent decades. Right. We've essentially taken a 40-year pay freeze uh, in America, pay cut for the bottom 50% of income earners. Uh, the net economic impact of women doubling their workforce participation between 1977 and 2012 was zero dollars in take-home pay for the bottom 90 percent of income earning households. Fifty percent of the country now makes less than $17 an hour. Third, a third makes less than $10 an hour. The average fast food worker is 35 years old and has a child. Uh, we've essentially transferred retirement risk entirely onto individual workers and consumers away from companies and institutions. Uh, and through a strategy uh, of essentially privatization, austerity, deunionization, globalization, uh, have created a world where we are a low-wage country and where we used to have the world's largest middle class, we now have the world's 27th largest middle class. And of the top 20 fastest growing jobs, 15 of them are low-wage jobs that require no more than a high school education. So when you think about your influence, as a, as a union, as an organizer, as a kind of public figure in this domain, and you think back on trying to move, move business, what are the leverage points? You know, I think public policy is a huge leverage point. I know that's not the main focus of today's discussion, but, you know, the re, the, when we had a peaceful, negotiated civic consensus in Seattle about a phased in $15 minimum wage uh, that was negotiated for four months across the bargaining table where I sat across from the guy who owns the Space Needle and the Sheraton Hotel and we reached an agreement between business and labor on how to implement a $15 policy citywide. I think that was in large measure because the business community, I'd say, you know, there were a group of folks who viewed it as their own self-interest. 
and consumer-facing companies said back in 2014, actually depressed sales are a bigger problem for us than higher labor costs. And if consumers have more money to spend because there's higher wages in the economy, that my restaurant, my, my retail store is actually going to do better. There was a second group of businesses that responded to the threat of potential ballot measure that would have taken it higher and faster. Um, and I think there was probably a group that never quite reconciled themselves to the direction the city was going, but ultimately just sort of had to follow the law once we passed it. So I w I'm going to move on to Andy, but I'm just kind of, I, I loved having your, your definition. I thought that was really very interesting. Did, did either of you have a reaction to it? Did it sound familiar? Is this the kind of thing that you would say, yes, we've thought about some of these things? Or that we, how did that seem in terms like of a definition of a good job? I'm just kind of curious. I think that, that what David laid out, you know, uh, is very familiar and certainly issues that, you know, companies are taking a look at. And, you know, right now a lot of this is happening state by state and for national companies it is challenging because we're having to look at each state and say, okay, how do we address what's going on in Seattle or San Francisco oftentimes has uh, different policies. and um, but you know, want to stay close to the conversation and stay engaged in the discussion. Maureen, did you have a reaction to the definition? No, I think that's the, basically the definition that, that we, pretty similar to the definition that, um, <coughs> that we would use. And um, uh, we do like the opportunity language. I, I mean, I think the voice in the workplace and sort of an opportunity to learn and grow is um, something that we see because, you know, when we think about a good job, it, it is all of those things of how you support yourself, but I think it's also, um, you know, work is what people spend most of their time doing, and it's an important uh, sort of part of how people structure their lives socially and how they derive, you know, sort of how they think of their identity as well. So I think thinking about um, what are opportunities uh, that, uh, within the job for people to feel like they're contributing to something, that they understand the work, uh, that they do it well, and that they do it with pride is an important uh, additional piece. And I totally meant to hand this microphone back to her. Sorry, I know I was supposed to do that. <laughs> so um, next, Andy. This is Andy Nonaway. Andy has plays kind of, in some ways you have, you could approach this from two different perspectives, or probably many, but one is having been a principal in the company Goya Foods, which was your family's Enterprise founded by your grandfather. Grand, grandfather in New York. But Andy also runs a private equity fund. I think will not be his last fund. I think we'll see more funds. And it is Hopefully. invested right. in middle market companies, so right. not public companies. So how do these <clears throat> questions resonate for you? Well, so, you know, we had a conversation earlier about l looking at economic opportunity versus what the end result is. And my job is to look at the end result first, right? I need to, my job is to take my money, we're, we're, I'm the second largest investor in our fund, and my investors' money, and get them the highest return possible. Um, so that's my, my job. So I look at that first before we invest in any companies. The way we try and create alpha or create returns is by growing the businesses, having the best workforce out there, um, and, and, increasing the bottom line so that when we sell the businesses in four, five, six years, we return as much capital as possible to our investors. On the, on the employment side and the uh, employee side, I would add one thing to, to David's definition, which to me is more about the end result versus the opportunity, is personal fulfillment. And how our employees feel about what they're doing to me is extremely important. And how they go home every day, what they think they've accomplished what they've been part of, how they feel part of a team or a family. I grew up in a family-run business. Business. We only invest in family-run businesses. So that part of family and part of community is extremely important to how we feel about our employees. Um, so when you were saying, we, you're, were you talking about Goya Foods? You're also talking no, about... my fund. Can you give an my example fund. of a company you've invested in and any, any way in which you as an investor have had to kind of parse what was going on there or help them think about these questions or do you simply, you only invest in companies that are pretty progressively thinking about no, these questions No, no, already? no, no, right? So we do everything from businesses that uh, have no real uh, employee packages for their employees, right? So I talk about one Raymundo's, 
uh, which is a, uh, a you know a consumer packaged good business that does snack food targeted the Hispanic community. I, we also invest in Hispanic oriented firms because of my background. Um, so this was a business with you know 300 employees when mm -hmm. we bought the business. Most of those were uh, you know hand laboring manufacturing jobs, um, and I would say those people went home every day. We had high turnover. Those people went home every day feeling they went to work completed a job, hoped they didn't get injured, and went home, and that was it. I think if you talk to those people now, we have a big ESG, environment, social, and governance component in my fund. We don't view that as impact investing. We view ESG as a way to create alpha for our, uh, for our, uh, for our uh, investors. Um, and we've, all those employees now have uh, health benefits, retirement packages, um, all those we are we have our workforce is much healthier, um, much safer. We used to go before we bought the business. I don't know the exact numbers, but anywhere from a week to ten days with a minor incident, a slip and fall. Right, floors are wet. There's machinery, heavy machinery. Um, we go now ninety to one hundred and twenty days normally without uh, a minor slip and fall or something like that. And part of the way that's happened is the employees feel part of something. So if I walk through the workforce and I don't have my booties and my, my hairnet on, sorry, but I still need to wear a hairnet. <laughs> um, um, Interesting. Employees will come up to me and say, you need to go back and, and dress up. And they're doing that to each other. So again, part of the community, and that to me is an extremely part of what a good job is, feeling you're, you're doing something in a community and going home being fulfilled, right? Going home and creating a salary and collecting a salary and going home to, to, to then be part of a family, that's not a good job to me. What, whether you're making $10 an hour, sorry, or, or $500,000 a year, if you're going home and you're not happy at work, as, as Maureen said, that's where we spend the majority of our day, that's not a good job. So where are you on the universal income concept? Uh, I don't know what the universal income concept so is. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's an idea that when we, as we kill off jobs through automation, that there should be a public policy that somehow there's a universal basic income. Hold that thought. Yeah. We may come back to that later. So Clara, Clara <coughs> yes. Miller, Clara is a long-standing friend and colleague of both uh, Maureen and I, but uh, runs the Heron Foundation, which is very much committed to this question of good jobs is the way I think of it. But tell us a little bit about the work of sure. Heron, and I specifically, if it's still operating, or even if it's not, I'd love to you to talk about the fund that you helped create at State Street. Uh, the USCII. Yeah. Yes. So anyway. As an example um, of what you do. So Heron is a private foundation. Uh, our mission is to help people and communities help themselves out of poverty. Um, you know, big is all outdoors, get it done by Monday morning. Uh, and we went through a, and, and traditionally we have, <clears throat> we have been distinctive from other anti-poverty foundations in that we, we, and this was long before I came about six years ago, we thought of our endowment, meaning you know, usually foundations business model is kind of like a hedge fund with a small giving program attached to it. Uh, it invests its corpus, its endowment conventionally, and then it gives away money. And neither side has anything to do with each other. We thought of our, our foundation endowment as something that we wanted to use to invest in good companies to have positive, the kinds of positive benefits everybody's been talking about on the panel. Um, and we went through an epiphany after the uh, financial crisis in, in 2008, in, in which before that we had been aligned with a lot of our, our fellow foundations in anti-poverty work, in that we thought access strategies were the way. Access, to, you know, training that would produce access to jobs or access to credit that would produce the ability to own a home because you could, you could buy it. And we realized all of those ideas were premised on having reliable jobs on the other side of that, of that proposition. And that in the financial crisis, part of what went wrong was that there were not those reliable jobs and that people were in debt who did not have the means to pay for them. And you know, this is sort of a massive duh moment, right? Uh, and, that, and that if we did not think of ourselves as part of a whole economy, uh, and that, that the idea of, of access strategies was a fool's errand. 
And so we had to say to ourselves, we, we want all of our assets to be working for our mission. We want everything we're investing in, whether it's a public company or a private equity fund, or whether it's a nonprofit organization, up and down, these you know, good jobs are at the, at the forefront, as opposed to access strategies to home ownership and other good things, which are also important. <laughs> but, but if you don't have the job in the house, you know, it's not, it's not going to work. It's not going to pan out. And um, so as a result, we, we started going down the path of saying, OK, who, who employs most Americans? And while you, know, you can say small business employs most Americans, mo many of those small businesses are in the supply chains of large public companies. For about 50% of Americans are employed by large companies. Uh, and, but, there's, but there's a huge tail of small businesses, which people talk about as being the engine of job growth. Um, but if you ignore, uh, if you say, well, we're just going to talk about job growth, where, where, do you, where do you add jobs? You're not necessarily, first of all, adding reliable or good jobs. And you're also not looking at what the public company space is supplying its workers. And they are. I must say, after our analysis, the better employers. It doesn't mean they're perfect employers. So pick one ones. strategy. I like the one at State Street because I know about it, but you may have a better one. Give us one example of something that you've done that's tied the well, markets Well, the USCII, in. That, yeah, which tell is us a, about that. it's, a, it's a, um, essentially an index um, that, uh, of, of, of public companies, RIP, has been. What does been, it stand for, first of all? Oh, the US Community Investing Index. And we started by looking at public companies and, and looking at the data about their employment practices and their, um, and their uh, kind of community development practices, let's say, um, and, and essentially uh, investing in a market basket of those on that basis. And State Street Global Advisors um, uh, uh, runs it for us. Um, and, and basically what, what we found was that it was very heavily invested in big banks when community development and housing was our focus. And it was performing all right, but after the financial crisis, it didn't perform very well. <laughs> this is not, not a big secret. And that when we pivoted and started looking at employment and jobs, uh, the, whole, the whole nature of the USCII had to change. And what we, what we started to discover... So what you did is you cre it's an index fund. Mm -hmm. It's marketed through State Street. But anybody can put their money into yes, the fund. Yes, absolutely. And it's essentially been a kind of a pre-selected. It's yep. vetted. We're saying, yep. we here and we State Street are saying, if you want to invest in public companies that have kind of We've good looked job at the following X number of companies, and we found that their, their employment practices are better than average. So when you <laughs> shifted, like what kinds of things came in and what kinds of things went out? Oh, good question. I'm not sure I'm prepared to answer okay. that. That's <laughs> but, but at any rate, what... What did happen was our, um, our performance improved. Oh, interesting. Uh, now, it may have been that the, important, <laughs> the performance improved relative to the mar market, because the market's been going gangbusters. But companies that had the best employment practices, from our point of view, uh, actually did better than the market. Do you have just one as, example of a company that you Well, I know that UPS up? is in there. Um, Interesting. Uh, I know. I think they came in, and and all of the big banks went out because because they were even risky though they for would other, have high even though they would they would have, have high, high ratings, salary and, rates. And, and, but uh, they had high salaries, but they weren't employing low weight people who were at entry level that I, we wanted to. Okay, employ. I want both I, you guys I would, to react I would, to that. I would, yeah. I would agree. Look, that's our focus, right? We we have a strong ESG focus, not for impact investing, not to make. Well, not to primarily make people's lives better. Our ESG focus is primarily to create better returns for our investors. We think if you can put a good ESG package together for each of our portfolio companies, you will create a better workforce. You will have 
cleaner label on your products. You will have a safer workforce. You will have a happier workforce. You will have, um, you know, a more diverse workforce, right? So you look at our companies, at how many women and minorities were at the C-suite on the board, if there was a board, and throughout the company, that has increased anywhere from 40 to 60% in each one of our companies. Um, and all that creates a better end product. We are strong believers. I don't know about in the public sector because that's a little bit out of, out of my focus, but in private businesses, especially in the size of deals we're looking at, a happy, talented, successful, fulfilled workforce and a strong ESG focus will put out a better end product that gets us higher returns. So thank you for that. I have one last, David, I want you to react when I said, but the banks, they pay a lot, right? Yeah. So but I want your reaction on that. And then I, the last the question part. to anybody who wants to respond to it, if one of you and, two. And I can just say, it's we're interested in low-skilled and entry-level folks, you know, coming in, having a reliable base, and then being able to go into some kind of reliable career path or training or something. Right. So it's not like, you know, we want to make sure everybody who gets out of Harvard Business School and goes, in, and goes and into not, banking. Oh, I see. So that's why the banks are not. Got it. <laughs> David. Well, um, first of all, I'm, as the chairman of a pension fund investment committee, I want to talk to both of you afterwards. And, uh, <laughs> spend this Happy yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what we experience. try to do no, at the no, ASP really really There is a revolution um, of capital but, going on. Um, <laughs> It's, I mean, to the banking point, people think about the Manhattan-based employment, but then you think about everyone who works in a bank branch, right? And they're essentially comp yes. they're in the same labor market as 7-Eleven. You're right. Right? And so the amount of low-wage employment generated by the richest financial institutions in the globe is actually quite considerable. Uh, what's, now, what's interesting is you look at that, you look at that labor market, and it does not have to be low-wage. Right? Because right. I mean, Walmart has a low-wage strategy, Costco, direct competitor, high-wage strategy. 7-Eleven, low-wage strategy, quick trips, direct competitor, right. high-wage strategy. Right. in and out Burger, high-wage strategy, McDonald's, low-wage strategy. So I think you know, one of the things we find that even when you're in the labor market right. where you're competing with Krispy Kreme and Jimmy John's and McDonald's, you can still run a very successful firm, even a publicly traded one, without using a high-wage strategy. And I'll, I'll also add, I, I live in Manhattan, and being in Manhattan, most of my friends are bankers. Um, they make a lot of money, and while they may be happy, they're not happy at their job most of the time. Yeah. And that, to me, is not a good job. I don't care if you make right sick numbers, a million, a million and a half dollars. If you're complaining every day when you go home to your wife you, and you're, you're, you're on edge all the time, it's not a good job. Well, as long as they're not a good job, maybe we could just spread more of it around a little yeah. bit. Um, <laughs> and just on the, on the banking point, and then I we're going to open it up. I, I just wanted to add, I mean, they do, wait, so we do still have half a million bank tellers. And this I also bring up just in the automation is going to eat all our jobs, right? So we've had ATMs since the 1980s. We still have half a million bank tellers. They do some different things. They do some different kinds of, so the job has changed a lot. So I think it's more, you know, so I just, I just put that out there as something I, to I think about. Say, Are we having an yeah. evolution or a revolution in terms of how and technology Banks went jobs? out par partly because of bigger systemic ris risk issues and that they weren't delivering value to their communities. Right. Because there were other factors besides employment. We don't think, you know, there is this kind of isolated good job thing and you just find a company that's just providing good jobs and it doesn't matter if it's polluting the environment. You know, it, it has to be a, a right. net benefit Great. to the world. So if you have a question or a comment, we'll just have to introduce yourself briefly and I'm gonna ask, pose one more. Anything on the public company versus private company? It must sound a little Nirvana-ish from the vantage point of a public company talking about, you know, Andy's kind of conversation. I, th I think public companies have very different kinds of pressures on them. I think there's a short-termism pressure. Absolutely. Uh, I think there's a kind of a transparency set of issues where they can't kind of work on their own problems in without, in, in some cases, impairing their brand. Yeah. Um, so, so there's lots of big pressures on public right. companies that might And without separate constituencies, there. right, that may not be focused on the best thing for the business attacking you. Yeah. So, I, I, I mean, I have much longer term. I'm, I'm not worried about a quarterly call, right? I'm worried about an end result anywhere from three to seven years out. My business would, my business, each one of my businesses would be run totally differently if I had to make a quarterly investment call 
a weekly meeting with analysts. It's, it's, it's a totally different structure, and, and some people are extremely good at it. I probably wouldn't be, uh, but it's, it, it's much easier, in my view, to run private businesses that can have much easier to create alpha and get better returns in the long term to run a private business and have a long-term view than yep, a public sure. company. Go ahead. But if I, I see any, you've got the first mic, great. But, but I do think that, that uh, ESG is continuing to gain momentum in private companies. Companies do care about this. In public companies. Um, public companies, absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's not just about um, caring because it's a, a moral thing to do. It's smart business to do this. Absolutely. And you know, just right. as you were talking about that, um, you know, we're all in the fight for talent. And the millennials, 80% of millennials want to work for a company that does more than generate profits. And they, you know, we have, um, uh, we need raw materials that uh, we need to think about using more consciously. So environmental practices are important. Absolutely. Labor practices are important. Um, so these are things that companies care about. And I also think that transparency, uh, you know, uh, Gap was one of the companies that, uh, first apparel companies to issue a social responsibility <coughs> report, you know, telling the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I think that there's greater transparency from public companies um, because they know their shareholders are looking for this. Mm -hmm. um, right. It's becoming more important. There are so. also huge leverage points, right? When you right. went to $10 a share, uh, $10 an hour, you were the first, scary. weren't you the first? <laughs> We were one of the first um, big companies to declare that we would go to $10 minimum wage. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can talk about Seattle in 15, but that was, a, that was in fact, uh, a market-shaping kind yes. of event when you, when you did that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, great conversation. Thank you very much. Um, I, I just wondered, in the, in the United Kingdom, we have a, a store called... Just George. introduce yourself very briefly. Uh, my name is Quinton McKellar, and I'm from uh, the United Kingdom. <laughs> we, we have a store called John Lewis, and John Lewis uh, has a, an interesting model where the employees are part owners, right. and uh, they, they, they seem to have a very successful model. It's a reasonably big business. I just wonder if there are any kind of equivalents yep. in the U.S. So the, and whether they work. So this is clearly one of the choice right. points for companies, right? Yeah. Profit sharing. Right. John Lewis Partnership is, is, a, is a model for that. Maureen, quick reaction to that, and then see who else... Yeah, so I think that's one of the things people are excited about, and, and especially, and it's not just for uh, large companies. Um, one of the things people are really interested in right now is uh, smaller companies, family-owned companies, as they're sort of thinking about what is their next generation leadership. Can they do an employee buyout of the company and, and use that as a way forward? So Andy, that's anything on? Uh, yeah, I, I will say on, on on the family side, there's lots of ways people look at it, right? So. Look, family businesses are all extremely unique, and they all have their own idiosyncrasies and quirks. Some don't want any ownership to leave the family. So within those structures, there are things called phantom shares and, and profit sharing, where it looks like you own a piece of the business, but when you leave, you don't take that ownership with you. Um, so there are oh, lots of- Oh, interesting. So, yeah. so the financial benefit of that accrues to them. They have no voting rights. The financial right. benefit accrues yeah, it's basically while a they're- phantom stock. Right, so it's it's like having a piece of ownership. You get all the benefits of the financial uh, benefits of owning stock, but when you leave, you get no ownership, right? So you don't worry about fracturing your 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 family base or your ownership right. base, and the family still retains 100% control within the family, which is sometimes has its own fights. What's and battles, an example but, of a company that does that? Um, there are are, are, there are, are several, and a lot are extremely private. So I don't. Prefer, right. okay. prefer not to David? speak of those. Just to, to the question specifically, uh, probably the largest employee stock ownership program is uh, Publix grocery store chain, mm -hmm. which is, I think, 125,000 employees. Or I could have and that family more. run. Yeah. And family run. Right. Uh, but where, you know, um, where it operates as an ESOP and distributes equity to all of its employees after a certain vesting period. The largest. We, what did we you don't say 125,000 employees? So I, it's somewhere in my book, operate? but I, Their brands it's mainly in Lakeland. the South. Lakeland based. Yeah, Lakeland, Jenkins family. Yeah. Lakeland, Florida. Yeah. Lakeland, Florida. And yeah. they're mostly in the Southeast? Yes. Yeah. And then the Cooperative Home Care Associates in the Bronx, which is a much, much smaller firm, but the largest U.S. private sector co worker cooperative. But, you know, Delta also gave shares right. to 85,000 employees as part of their turnaround. I mean, that's a story that is being told more widely as well. So it is, it is, I think, a live conversation. Yeah. I'm really glad you brought that into the room. Uh, okay, I see five. Yep, I see mics. Go. <laughs> she <laughs> yes, wins. Stand up. 
I have to stand. Yes. Uh, my name is Patty Alper. I have just come out with a book, which Maureen knows about, called Teach to Work. It's about mentoring. Uh, my opening chapter, I've interviewed major corporations on how they're um, proactively trying to teach uh, kids how to enter the workforce because schools are not doing so. And I'm curious what you all would have to say to educators. What would be three top points you would want educators to teach youth? I'm, I'm going to allow one of you, if you have a strong reaction to this, because otherwise we're going to go into education, and we said we're not. But um, anybody have a quick reaction to this? Well, my quick reaction would be that uh, the private sector and educators should talk more. I, be, at, be at the table together and find out what are the needs of business and how do you align education with those needs. I would just say get rid of safe zones in colleges. <laughs> get rid of what? Safe zones safe in zones. colleges. Oh, man. <laughs> exactly. um, hi, I'm, um, I'm Evan Harrell from uh, Harvard Business Review. And uh, one of the things that we're grappling with is the question, I guess the way that I would summarize it is, you know, five, five, ten years ago, I remember sustainability was a big um, uh, issue on the corporate agenda. And there was a, a question among environmentalists is, uh, uh, although these programs are great, uh, they're going to be insufficient for tackling the climate crisis, and that we're going to need some sort of policy intervention carbon tax. I wonder, I feel, I feel like a, a few echoes in the conversation around good jobs in the sense that hearing about these wonderful ESG programs, et cetera, are great, but is it really going to tackle um, the issue? Or so do in we other words, do we need policy is your question. Yeah. Pass the mic across the aisle to the man with the, uh, there you go. Yes. Yeah. Um, so so um, I think that that's, a, that's an interesting question. And the first company that came to mind, you know, I mentioned we do this good companies, good jobs, is this company, New Seasons Market. Um, that's a grocer and uh, uh, based out of Portland. And, <coughs> Um, and what they struggled with was as the cost, so, so it's a complicated question, right? As the cost of housing went up in Portland, all of a sudden the wages that they were paying weren't enough for people to live nearby anymore. And they got as much efficiency as they could out of, their com out of the company to try to make the jobs as good as they could. But they did sort of see like, you know what, we can't do this just one company by ourselves. Our margins are too thin. We're going to have to raise our prices so that we're not competitive. So we can make the jobs better but we may not be able to make them good enough so that people can um, you know, support themselves without any other outside assistance on what we're able to pay them in the context of our firm. So I think it's, it's, it's kind of a dependent, um, you know, I think different industries, that, that looks different. Uh, how much can a company do within the context of the company versus how much do we need to say as a society, what are our expectations around work? I also think that the, um, the uh, idea that the government is going to come in with policies either for climate change or for for employment and jobs uh, is is something that we might want to kind of put on the shelf for a while. Well, that's and a therefore, <laughs> we're having well, local and state, but climate change is is one of those things. And I think um, I think that what's happened is that because ESG risk is actually material risk. And because the large asset managers and pension funds and others have started to come into the conversation in a kind of a revolution of capital, if you will, and say, sorry, we, don't want, we want to make sure that the companies we're investing in are taking these risks into consideration and are not, in fact, departing from, from what is good for the long term. Uh, there's a very different kind of conversation than just everything that has to do with what's good for all of us has to go through some sort of government policy um, hopper. I do, I do agree that policy is hugely important. I just don't think we should count on it. The other question is where will the policy come from? Yeah. Business isn't engaged yeah. in essentially going for hybrid policy. I, actually, you, you know, you, you, you cut me off by, by focusing on policy, but it's a, little bit, it's a little bit more complicated than that, I think, because it's not just about policy, it's about corporate leadership in terms of having, moving the conversation forward around corporate leaders saying we're not we're not able to we're not going to be able to create jobs like when do we start having leaders standing up and saying this is a problem so i wanted to kind I, of I think address that's that starting thank to happen thank you for that yeah. thank you for that yeah. correction i think that's a really important point. Yep. quick reaction and then we have time for one more question 
Oh, I, I think that that's already starting to happen among yeah. corporate leaders. <coughs> yeah. I, can, I just want to give time. Yeah. Alan, last question. Hi, um, good morning. My name is Alvin Warren. I work for the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. So thank you much, very much for everything that you've shared um, with us this morning. So uh, my question is really kind of contextually based um, in the fact that we were focused on priority places in the United States, and two of those places are Mississippi and New Mexico, mm -hmm. both of which are states that have had a very difficult time recovering from, from the economic downturn that, that um, Clara talked about. Mm -hmm. Um, and in many cases, we're working simultaneously both to try to encourage small businesses, especially small businesses, either creation by lower income individuals or, in, or individuals of color, um, and at the same time trying to push for quality jobs all along the lines that you've described. Um, often we've heard those two are in contention, like especially in, in, in more challenged markets um, that it's asking too much to try to say, okay, if in a place that is simply trying to create jobs, it's too much to try to also say, well, you have to create high quality jobs. We don't, of course, believe that. So I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are. How do we work simultaneously in both of those places um, to encourage job creation, but encourage the creation of good jobs? So I, I think that there's a big tension between startup uh, entrepreneurship, you know, sole proprietor organizations, which are very risky and are not going to be reliable employers, by and large, just by the, by the numbers. And, and good jobs. I think that's correct. I mean, I don't, however, I do think that all along the economic spectrum, there's, there's opportunity. If we don't get anchor employers, and I would include you know, big public companies and private companies, but also universities. And uh, you know, you know, there's lots of different kinds of enterprises, governments, and so on. <laughs> Uh, to start f focusing on quality jobs, you know, we're, we're going to be lost. No, I just wanted to hear. Marie? Uh, well, I think, I think there's, I think you think about how do you create. Um, you have 15 seconds. They're going down the uh, all right. Well, I, I would say they don't have to be perfect jobs, but I think focusing entrepreneurs on the quality of jobs that they're creating and thinking and having them focus on the value that their employees are bringing to the firm and how do they start building sort of a virtuous cycle as the firm succeeds, they show that success and they can think about how those jobs can be better and how people can be better equipped to even contribute more to the to the firm. Um, I'm sort of channeling my inner Zainab Tan here. You know, you sort of start with what you can do and then you build on it and make things better. Yeah. That's a great summary. Um, I, to an inducement to those of you who are trying to get to sit in the front of the room, we have about 20 copies here of an article that came out in Harvard Business Review last month called The Error at the Heart of Corporate Leadership. And it's about a corporate value. It's about this question of public companies and what can they actually do and the constraints of public markets and has a really brilliant vision for how we move forward here. I can't say enough good things about this article. So 